Video recordings of this podcast can be found on RaisingEquity.org and Truth to Power on YouTube. Welcome to Raising Equity, where we think deeply and differently about issues of equity and identity. We have a series here that we're calling White Folk Work. And part of the reason why I think it's important is that oftentimes when it comes to issues of oppression and privilege, we don't focus on the work it takes as a member of a group who has power and privilege in society, the work that it takes to try to fight against that system of oppression. And too often, we we to keep the status quo, we don't highlight that work, right? Like there were white folks who were against slavery and who were abolitionists when slavery was happening, but we often don't know those stories and tell those stories. So I wanted to be on purpose about sharing the stories of white folk work and not in a, a condescending, oh, look at white people doing their work sort of way, give them a gold star, but in really having them think about and talk about how they came to understand the importance of doing white folk work and, and not that it's all roses even, like what it takes and, and how they would support other folks who have power and privilege in society in working towards equity. And so today we have with us Christy Huck. She's executive director at City Garden Montessori, and I really appreciate you coming to sit and chat with us. Thank you, Kira. I appreciate the invite. Yeah. It's exciting to be here. I'm glad you're here. So I want to start with just hearing in your words why white folk work is important. Why is it necessary to to even call it that? Yeah. Um, so I believe white folk work is essential um, and that we have an absolute responsibility in dismantling racism and committing fully to dismantling racism, identifying where, um, where racism shows up, understanding our internalized superiority, um, that has been a manifestation of systemic racism, um, in our culture. And as part of the group that has held power, centuries and that has uh, put in place all the systems that, that perpetuate inequities and perpetuate racism. Um, if we are not doing the work, then really, you know, racism can't end. And so I think white folks have a really, really critical role. It's imperative uh, that we that we deeply understand racism, that we understand how we've benefited from it, how we continue to benefit from it, um, and then what our role is in interrupting, you know, identifying and interrupting racism and how it plays out in our lives, in our institutions, in our own psyches and, you know, individual manifestations. Mm -hmm. And how did you come to care about these issues? How did you come to care about racism? Because, I mean, let me be clear, mm -hmm. white women have been, like you said, part of that system. Mm -hmm. And even though you experience oppression as a woman, as a white woman, have helped to maintain and prop up white supremacy. So yeah. why care about it? Because there's lots that don't. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I can, I notice and can see on a daily basis how I am, you know, how I benefit, how I'm given the benefit of the doubt and, and privileged in so many ways. Um, and I guess I would say that, you know, I feel a deep, I feel a deep sense of, um, I feel a calling really to, to this work and working towards truth and, um, justice and equity is, has become a part of my own, you know, kind of path to liberation and, uh, what helps me feel good about myself, feel whole as a person. Um, but I will just share a little bit about my journey. Please do. Um, I actually, so my parents, uh, were sort of social justice -y people. Um, my dad was a conscientious objector in the Vietnam war and they were very Catholic, very religious, and um, part of kind of that Vatican II era. Um, so social justice was kind of part of our, our family culture. Um, they decided intentionally that they wanted to raise us in a racially diverse neighborhood. Um, so they moved to the Ferguson area when I was about four years old. 
Um, and so throughout my whole growing up, we lived in racially and socioeconomically diverse neighborhoods. And I went to mostly diverse schools. Um, and it was, it was really interesting because um, even though we lived around people, you know, that didn't look like us and very different from us culturally and went to school with folks um, that were very different from us, I always could feel kind of an invisible wall between myself and my African-American peers. Um, and I hated it. I mean, I, I never knew as a child how to articulate that, but I could feel this like separation between us. And I also felt distrust from my African-American peers. Um, and I definitely had very clear instances where I was treated much differently, kind of treated as, I mean, I remember one day when um, one of my my black classmates came to school and was saying some things to me um, that were kind of upsetting. And the adults made this huge deal out of it, called all the parents and like made this huge deal because I was this little white girl and, you know. They wanted to protect you. God forbid I be, yeah, treated this way. And I wasn't asking for that. You know I mean? It, I actually felt sort of ashamed and knew that then there was no hope that I would have a relationship with this kid, um, which actually, you know, had a really negative impact on me as mm. a child. The way the institution kind of came to your rescue right. and took the opportunity for maybe having a relationship and getting over the bump in the road that kids' relationships have. Right. You yeah. You probably didn't get over that. Right. And so I think sometimes, um, you know, we don't talk about how this stuff actually strips us from of our humanity as white people, as white women, girls. Um, and so that really, I mean, those kinds of experiences really stuck with me. And then when I went to college, I, uh, I, and I had been involved in a lot of service stuff. I was always like interested in trying to understand, um, you know, injustice and kind of the, the challenges of our society um, but I also didn't have, you know, I, was, I didn't have all the language and sort of the lens and framework. Um, then in college, I took my first sociology class and, you know, felt like my professor sort of laid out for us, like, this is how our society has become the way it is. And my mind was just blown. <laughs> yeah. You got to love professors and just learning. Seriously. Like give you words and, and frameworks for what you know. Yes. But don't know. I felt like I got language and a framework for what I had experienced my whole life and the things that I was seeing and feeling, but didn't know, you know, in, and all of a sudden it was like, of course my black peers wouldn't trust me. Of course, you know, this is how this, all of this played out. And we have all been like set up you know, set up to not connect with each other, set up for things not to be fair. Um, and so then I got really fired up mm -hmm. um, and kept, you know, kept tr learning, kept kind of on that path of trying to understand more and more deeply. Um, and so I was really, really fortunate to have some amazing professors and some amazing people in college that helped shape my thinking. I ended up getting to study African-American women's literature with a amazing woman named Cleora Hudson Weems and Africana womanism. Um, and then I also began to meet activists uh, who were doing work, not just kind of in terms of theory and being able to, to give language and frameworks to it, but actually like working on policy issues and issues in our community there in Columbia, where I was in school. What were some of the issues that activists were working on? What were some of the movements that were? Yeah. Well, working? I got to know the Catholic worker community really well. Um, and so they were doing a lot of work on, on homelessness and uh, addressing um, some of the local issues, uh, you know, facing unhoused folks in Colombia, but also, um, also some, some human rights issues. So we actually, so they were doing a whole lot of work on something called the school of the Americas, which was, um, this, this army base and army program, uh, where the United States, the United States government was actually training people to go into Latin American countries and other countries and basically 
undermine government and undermine some of the the democratic um you know policies and even elected officials in governments that had been put in place in order to maintain power um and so that that's where you know as i began to learn and understand some of the ways that you know that racism and injustice and inequities have been literally put in place with resources and with power and influence and, you know, and policies um, through our government, you know, and then looking at how that's connected to, to corporations and, and wealth in our country, you know, just, yeah, began to inform more and more uh, of my understanding of how deep all of this goes um, and how, how it's perpetuated, how all of this sustains. So it sounds like early on in your education or politicization, yeah, it sounds like early on in your education, you were politicized to see the system at work, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. And sociology is good for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's something I've been thinking a lot about with raising equity is that how we often teach kids and people to be kind and to be nice and to respect and to tolerate, mm -hmm. but we don't make clear how the systems are operating, how the resources are flowing. Mm -hmm. And that's key. Yeah. So you came to where you are now with all of that knowledge, um, which I think is important just to name that it mm -hmm. wasn't like you were uh, this, just a well-meaning white woman who wanted to make this integrated school that you come with an analysis. Yeah. Well, and I have to say, I mean, it's been an ongoing journey and I, it will be forever. I, you know, I was not socialized to be a disruptor. Um, and so, you know, through, through every part of my uh, development and evolution as a person, I've had to acknowledge and lean into work to lean into the discomfort that that brings. Um, so I ended up organizing people to go down to the School of Americas and protest and actually, you know, do civil disobedience and stuff. But it was super uncomfortable because my family members, you know, were critical. My friends were like, what, you know, what in the world are you doing? Um, but that, you know, it became really clear that that's part of like, this stuff is so deep and so deeply entrenched that we actually have to work really hard to get comfortable with being uncomfortable and pushing against, you know, the socialization and all the things within me that tell me like, actually, if you're going to be good and if you're going to be right and you're going to be successful, then you need to take this path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting that you would say that it it feels uncomfortable and i actually think it's a gift that you're honest that it's it's not comfortable mm -hmm. and that you have to lean into the discomfort because when you think about like the role of city garden so we can talk a little bit about it but mm -hmm. city garden montessori is a school that's a public montessori mm -hmm. it's a charter school mm -hmm. uh it was started without a major you had a sponsor of course you had to but with like with, it wasn't a corporation right mm -hmm. there were all sorts of ways in which this little school, like this little engine that could, mm -hmm. is is it is disruptive mm -hmm. to the way people think that public education could be. It's racially and socioeconomically diverse. It's mm -hmm. not only a school in a neighborhood, but is active in housing policy and has a voice in other ways in the community. Like it's disrupted the status quo around public education, mm -hmm. at least in Missouri. And I know in the Montessori, the public Montessori sphere nationwide. Yeah. Yeah. And that also has been an evolution, um, which you're, you know, very familiar with it. We started out um, a group of parents who actually, you know, there were a few of us who had this lens, you know, different coming from different backgrounds because it was a multiracial group of parents, um, but knew that that the way our education systems are set up. Um, are a prime example of how inequity is at work, you know, it, in our systems um, and a very, very real way in which those inequities impact our daily lives. Um, and so we started, you know, kind of looking at schools together, looking at the options, also had moved into the set of neighborhoods that City Garden now serves, um, which are and, and were racially and socioeconomically diverse 
But, you know, when I moved into my neighborhood, which I moved into because of its diversity, within a few weeks, you know, my white neighbors were saying things to me like, um, oh, you know, we're really working on the problem properties and um, saying things about our neighbors who play their music loudly and things. And which coded language was super clear, like, oh, okay, so we don't actually all live together near, you know, with each other, we live near each other. Right. Proximity, but not relationship. Right. And we live parallel lives sort of. And it was very clear who had the power and influence in our neighborhoods. Mm. Um, And so the vision for creating City Gardens Charter School really, you know, came out of both of those things, like really seeing and feeling and experiencing the, you know, that sort of separate reality within our neighborhoods. um, And also the tremendous inequities that exist in our education systems and seeing, you know, at three o'clock that most of the African-American kids in our neighborhood were walking home from the neighborhood public school, which had frankly been failing for years. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, most of the white children walking home from the neighborhood parochial school, which had just won a blue ribbon school award. Um, And so some of us getting together and saying like, this is crazy. This is not okay. What can we do? you know, what can we do? We weren't, you know, we weren't setting out to be disruptors, but that is what we ended up, you know, doing. Um, And if I think if people really think about their own communities and look at the schools to create a school that is racially and socioeconomically diverse is an anomaly mm -hmm. because our education system is so segregated. Mm -hmm. There's hyper segregation in terms of class and race and so while you didn't set out to be disruptors, what you wanted mm-hmm. was a disruption of the status quo. Right. Right. And we had to we had to do some, you know, fairly like covert organizing to to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and like garner resources. It was a really grassroots, you know, effort and we didn't have, you know, power or resource really. Um, although, you know, I certainly recognize more now that. It was important for me as a white woman to who felt very empowered to say what I thought and felt righteous in my anger. You know, it was important for me to uh, to sort of not take no for an answer throughout that process. I think it also has been important, and certainly I've done lots of this imperfectly, but it's also been important for me to recognize and acknowledge that that like I entered that situation with some power and influence and privilege. Um, and I continue to have that and need, and, you know, I need accountability and need partners to help me, you know, look in the mirror and make sure that I'm aware of that and, and doing my work to identify and interrupt that stuff. Yeah. How do you do that? Right. So one of the things that I often, uh, talk to folks about is you know, making sure that your social network, your, your professional network, but also your, your own personal network is mm-hmm. racially, socioeconomically just diverse in all sorts of ways. Like mm-hmm. you said, to have people give you feedback that are in relationship with you so you can hear them. And, mm-hmm. um, but that's not easy mm-hmm. because we can sometimes live these parallel lives. So how do you cultivate relationships with other white women who are doing this work and people of color mm-hmm. and folks from different backgrounds? Yeah. And I, so I think it is absolutely, um, it's a commitment that we have to make, that I have to make. And city, the, the journey and evolution of City Garden has been such a gift in that way. Um, I mean, in, in the early days, like part of my work was to build relationships with families. Um, and so I had the enormous privilege of getting to know lots of families and and trying to talk with families and like, listen and understand, try to understand, you know, what families, what parents needs and interests are. Um, and so I've made a lot of really amazing relationships through city garden. Um, but it has been, I've had to commit over and over again to, um, prioritize relationships, you know, with people of color and to lean into the discomfort that is, that exists there. Um, I will share, so I have a dear friend, Erica Bennett, and so she is the mom of my son's, my son Jude's best friend, Jabari. Um, so Jabari and Jude were some of the founding kids at City Garden together, became good friends. And early on in their relationship, uh, 
Jude asked to have Jabari and his brother Kefeli to spend the night. And I was like, great, you know, and so Erica and I coordinated and they came over, spent the night. And in my house, you know, we don't pay that much attention to like showering every night, at least at that age, um, and making sure like, long story short, the kids had the same clothes on all night, left the next morning, probably didn't brush their teeth. And Erica was like, you didn't care for my children. Erica called me <laughs> hot and read me the riot act and was like, I don't, don't know what goes on in your house, but my children do not leave the house in the without same having clothes. showered in the same clothes. <laughs> they came home. Their dad picked them up. Like, that will not happen again. Right. Right. And I. White folks and their feral children. Yes. Which then I'm like, okay, I have feral children. Yes, that is true. Love it. But, you know, I... It I, takes honesty and a relationship to say that. Yes. And actually, I was so grateful to Erica for, like, believing in me enough to actually call me out and, like, call me and yell at me. Right. And then was like... Then at the end of it, she's like, okay, so next, next time, time... And I was like, yes, I will never, ever do that again. And please tell me anything else that right. I am doing that is not, you know, yeah. and that, but that, okay with you. I think that's important. I appreciate you sharing that story and being vulnerable because I think sometimes people get so offended. And it's like, actually, that was a gift because she could have said, y'all won't ever go back there again. Exactly. And there would have been no comment. You wouldn't have known what happened and why. Maybe the boys would have talked to each other. But probably not because, mm -hmm. I, but, well, yeah. Probably not. Right. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Right. right. Maybe. Yeah. And on, and we could have lost out on like another decade. Uh, I mean, now our families are actually like families. Like we're at each other's right. family gatherings and things. And one of the like greatest gifts I have received in my mm. life. Mm. Um, and Erica does that on a regular basis. You know, like she is one of my accountability you know, people in my life and will never hold back when she, you know, and says like, Christy, you're being real white right now. And I'm so grateful because yeah. it has, you know, it's been an enormous, yeah, gift for me. Um, at the same time, I also recognize that I can't just rely on Erica and my other friends of color to like keep me in my lane or to keep me honest. Um, that I have had, which I think is also, you know, I think developmentally as white people going through our own racial identity work, you know, sometimes I think we can get to a point where we're like, oh, I just need to surround myself by people of color. And like, not, you know, and like that makes me woke. That makes me informed. You know, I'll, I'll do this better. And in like, it's it, well intended. Um, but I realized, you know, at a certain point that I was probably relying on Erica and some of my other friends of color too much. Um, especially like when Ferguson happened and mm. all the things that were going on in St. Louis and in our community and intense emotions that all of us were having and, and going through. Um, and I needed to reach out and connect more with white people and white anti-racist people. And we reckon, you know, like recognized we had some work to do, you know, both, on ourselves, but mm -hmm. also like in calling in and in connecting with other white folks. Yeah. Um, and doing more of our white folk work. Right. Well, and what you speak about in racial identity development theory, it's a pseudo independent white identity, mm -hmm. right? So pseudo independent because it's it's not really, it's fake. Like you're getting your sense of, oh, I'm I'm white and woke and anti racist, but it's it's in proximity or taking on the culture of someone else. Right. Rather than being in your whiteness, but not in a white supremacy sort of way, Yeah, but in an authentic who you are, knowing the history of anti-racism, yeah. knowing the full history of, of, of your family and heritage kind of white person. Yeah. Um, and that's, that is, that's important. I wonder if you could do a little bit of um, bragging on City Garden and just let folks know some of the successes. So, so We've talked a little bit about the institution, but mm -hmm. also heard about your personal journey. And I wanted to say it's like a, it's this both and. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the successes that this this school mm -hmm. that you have 
that you helped create, you helped get funding for, you've now been the executive director how many years? Um, in my ninth. Nine, yeah. nine years, yeah. right? I do think it's important to to share some of the successes. Thanks. Well, and I think City Garden is an example of what can happen when community members, you know, like when community happens, when we commit to each other to be in relationship, to wrestle with the hard stuff and to re- and to follow our children and to really, you know, like keep working towards um, something different and towards change. Um, I will say, so we we did work really hard to create a racially and socioeconomically integrated school community. We've been about 50% white, 50% families of color um, since our inception in 2008. Um, and we have, you know, we've ha- hovered around half or a little less than half um, students, uh, under-resourced students or free or reduced lunch eligible students. Um, but then a couple years into our operating as a charter school, I think is where we began, you know, where the w- real work began mm-hmm. um, because we had this diverse community but we began to solicit feedback from our parents about kind of like, how's the experience been so far? How is this going for people? And because we had built relationships with families of color, like Erica um, and other families, uh, they were really candid with me and with us and said, like, Christy, like, this is great. You got some good things going on. And like, I'm still shut down in parent meetings, you know, my ideas are not actually listened to by other parents, sometimes teachers, sometimes leaders. Um, and frankly, my kids experience things in our classrooms sometimes that they shouldn't in a school that claims to be progressive and play, you know, claims to have a social justice commitment. And that's when uh, we really stepped back, kind of the leadership of the school and the small administrative team sort of stepped back and said, okay, clearly we have deeper work to do here. And this is actually our mission and our vision to create something that is actually different and is truly inclusive and equitable. And that's when we called you. <laughs> well, um, yeah. actu- well, actually, do you remember? Yeah, I think you put out something in the newsletter. Yeah. So full disclaimer for folks who are watching or listening, uh, both of my kids go to City Garden. Yeah. And I had a, I have a friend whose child, do I have multiple friends? I, I do have multiple friends now, but... One friend whose children went Mm -hmm. to City Garden. And so when we moved to St. Louis, I said, well, we're living in this rectangle to be able to get in this catchment. And so I think it was in our first year, you put out in the newsletter something about the desire to be an institution that dismantles racism. Right. And I called and I said, Christy, what do you mean by that? Right. Or I I don't, I maybe emailed her. I think you emailed back and you said, so that was that moment when we had gotten feedback and we were like, okay, clearly we have some work to do. We don't know what it looks like yet, but we're going to start putting it out there and we're going to figure, figure out what it means. Mm -hmm. And I put that in in an email and you emailed back and said, so if you really, if you're serious about this, I would love to be part of it and, and help. And this is what I do. Mm -hmm. And I was like, are you kidding me? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And then, yeah, and then we worked with you, the, our little admin team over that whole year, mm-hmm. really, mm-hmm. and you helped us get language and helped us identify, you know, create a lens and framework. Yeah, because um, I think the desire at first was maybe to like get something off the shelf that would be a curriculum that you might implement mm-hmm. with the kids in the classroom. And I remember saying, oh, let's slow down. Let's do this year of exploration with leadership. Because yeah. if you rush to to implement something that the teachers aren't prepared to hold, right. that the parents, and if you've got really active parents, are not prepared to hold, right. and that then the admin can't back up, it can squash it more than right. create opportunities to grow. And I think that is some of the best advice you ever gave us and that anyone has ever given us, honestly. Awesome. Um, because we have groups, we have schools, you know, other groups come to us all the time and are like, tell us the programs you do. And we repeat that Mm -hmm. over and over again. Actually, you know, we had to start with the adults and the adult culture. And it took several years. I mean, really, and talk about disruption. So then after our work working with you, our year working with you, then we began to bring Crossroads anti-racism organizing and training and began to do deep training, you know, with the whole staff on understanding racism and how it shows up in our community and in our institution. Um, and, and it, and then we tried to get board mandate, right? right? Well, not tried to, it ultimately did, but 
the piece around, okay, maybe this training, but then you have to ask for more resources behind it. Right. And I think folks get uncomfortable. Yeah. Well, and it, it did. It elicited major conflict within our community because um, we were we were moving into a new building and people had all kinds of wants and, and okay. you know, ideas design. about what should happen. Right. The school, it should be education only. You're overstepping your bounds with this anti-racism right. stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think, you know, because we had done some grounding in the analysis, we were able, and with your help, um, and help of others, we were able to identify, you know, some of what was going on, which was that people who are used to having influence and voice and power, you know, were being pushed back on. And I mean, cause we got stronger and we got braver as we went along and began to say no more and began to actually like, you know, going to put a stake in the ground around what our values are and what we were going to put resources into. And it made some people really angry. Oh yeah. And so we had to, you know, kind of take on, uh, yeah. So, yeah, take on in some ways, our white parent community. Oh, yeah. I remember when that one parent like called a rogue meeting and handed out flyers at a school event that was totally right. not safe. We had people like <laughs> organizing on us using our copier <laughs> in our parking lot. People are bold. <laughs> right. So, I mean, white people. These were white parents. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just to be clear. Yeah. I mean, and so you, you know, there have been so many like vivid examples of how this stuff plays out. Yeah. Right. And at the same time, you know, I mean, uh, there are clearly lots of emotions and lots of like feelings about it all. And, you know, I think we were able to say like, this isn't necessarily this individual's fault or, you know, like it's not, it's not because this particular set of parents is mean or, or yeah. bad. It, it is like, this is how we are socialized and this is what's playing out. Yes. And so we had to kind of keep returning to, okay, yes. we we are going to figure out then what we need to do to identify and interrupt these dynamics. Yes. Right? It, it is about those systems dynamics. It's not always it's not always about this individual person being a bad person, mm -hmm. although sometimes people are problematic. But right. it is about understanding how this work, and especially among white folks, can feel very uh, uncomfortable, mm -hmm. very uncomfortable and and disruptive, like you said, in your own psyche. If you've been socialized to think of yourself as the norm and superior and better, even if even if it's not been that explicit, mm -hmm. that your ideas should be heard, that what you say should be valued. Right. And then you have this institution that's trying to create equity mm -hmm. around race and class. It can feel like Right. You're being disenfranchised or something's being taken away or, yeah. um, and that's, that's where it's this like both and of like individual work and institutional work. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I think it was a, it was a huge moment for us when we started looking at our academic disparities and asking not just like, what do we need to do to help our African-American students, you know, achieve at this level, but actually how is the education gap benefiting white families? How does, how, how does this gap, how do these disparities actually benefit my children and our white, you know, our white kids mm -hmm. and families? Mm -hmm. And I think when we shift that yeah. question, you know, it just puts a whole different um, kind of how take, do, take on then how we need to respond, right? How do you think it does benefit white families and how does it inform the response? Yeah. I mean, I think when, you know, when you get down to it, like. It impacts, you know, our access to resources where my child gets to go to high school and then, then, you know, the path that he then is on uh, in life and towards career and towards future income and mm. all kinds of things, you know. And so I, it is something that in terms of our culture at City Garden, we, again, we're still in in our development and doing things imperfectly, but have tried to become more and more mindful about, you know, like even the amount of time that we dedicate towards answering emails or, you know, taking meetings and spending on meeting, you know, some family's needs versus other and making sure that we're being really mindful around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I, 
feel like we could go on for a long time and talk about what you've learned at City Garden, what it's doing. Um, but I'm feeling like it might be good to let people know how they can learn more about City Garden, how they could maybe donate to such a great school. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And it, so it is, it's really exciting that we now, you asked me to brag a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'll just say, you know, now we are in our 11th year as a charter school. Um, we, we do have, you know, excellent outcomes. Our students are amazing. We have an amazing parent community, amazing group of teachers. Um, we're getting ready to grow. Um, and we have been able to be somewhat of a catalyst for anti-bias, anti-racism education, not just in St. Louis, but even nationally, there is a there's a really strong community now of Montessori folks um, that are working on Montessori. So there's a group called Montessori for Social Justice, um, and are doing disruption work nationally. Um, we're also part of a you know part of folks in St. Louis that are really working to to help um, kind of spread the analysis and awareness and build language and build capacity for understanding racism and how to interrupt it. Um, and we just have a great community. So if people want to learn more, we love, love, love having people engaged in our work in lots of different ways. So our website is citygarden.citygardenschool.org. Um, you can always email me, Christy at citygardenschool.org. And we are getting ready to, to expand our impact in some exciting ways and hope to really and kind of forge a path in St. Louis and beyond around anti-racism education. That's awesome. So, yeah. And when I say donate to City Garden, I don't just mean monetary. Yeah. Because that City Garden is a place where you can go donate your time even. I, when I had a little bit more time in my schedule, would go and read with the kids mm -hmm. in lower elementary, which is first through third grade in Montessori. And it was beautiful to see like some other retired grandparents or just folks in the community who would also come and do math work and read mm -hmm. with the kids. Uh, it's, it's a place that's cozy. It's mm -hmm. not a sterile school. Mm -hmm. I was laughing because the other day my son picked up the phone and called me from his classroom. <laughs> Only at city garden <laughs> do they have access to phones that way. Uh, but it, it is a cozy family atmosphere. And so if you can't donate your money, donate your time, it's a great place. Um, I felt like it was, uh, an opportunity to talk to Christy, who not only has done the individual work as a white person, as a white woman, but also has put that into action um, through City Garden. One example of the way that you've been doing great white folk work. So I you. appreciate you sitting with us. I appreciate you being a partner in this work and all that you do. Thank you. And thank you all for joining me in Raising Equity. <laughs>